Uh, so on to tonight's program, I wanted to introduce our speakers tonight, uh, Bonnie Rosenthal and Fred Gervasi. Um, both are past presidents of Save Our Seminary, um, and Bonnie's currently our administrator. And between them, they have 43 years of working with this property. So they really know what's what around these grounds. Um, so Bonnie's going to start with a brief overview of the sculptures, and then Fred's going to take a look at each one and tell us the history and the meaning of, of the individual sculptures. And then Bonnie's going to circle back and talk about some of SOS's current efforts. Um, she will have a special announcement that we're very pleased um, that we'll be able to give you tonight. And also, she'll be able to answer any questions you have. So without further ado, Bonnie. Well, welcome everyone. Good to see you all on a lovely September evening. Um, our, this evening's program is about the outdoor sculpture or the statues that still exist at National Park Seminary. By the time the, the seminary had reached its heyday in the mid-1920s, the campus contained nearly 100 pieces of sculpture in a variety of materials and subjects. Today, however, only about 30 still exist. But we're unfortunate that even this number remain, as the others were lost to theft, deterioration, or perhaps even sold over the years. For the young women of the seminary, the sculpture that surrounded them provided lessons in art and history that supplemented their book learning. Like the varied styles of architecture throughout the campus, the sculpture also brought them knowledge of the wider world. It was a deliberate design that the school provided an environment where, quote, art lent its influence to every aspect of National Park Seminary. These still existing sculptures are just as important to us today as they reflect the past art and culture of the seminary that we can also learn from and enjoy. Your lesson in statue culture this evening will be presented by Fred Gervasi, who will describe the history and significance of each of the outdoor statues that still exist. Then I will speak about the role of Save Our Seminary in preserving these statues for the future. Fred? Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I'm going to start uh, talking first about the statues that SOS has, has played a role recently in, in um, um, preserving, cleaning, stabilizing, uh, doing, making a positive uh, accomplishment uh, uh, with regard to the statues, uh, and in some cases working with the developer, Alexander Company, as they made their positive contribution to the statues. So we'll start with the, uh, the fountain, which I'm sure all of you have seen. Uh, it is uh, located at the center of the campus. Uh, it's, uh, it's located in DeWitt Circle in front of the main building, um, which, uh, which, as I say, is right in the heart of the campus. It's made of marble. Uh, it, uh, well, we know fountains were once functional, uh, but nowadays they are pretty much ceremonial and monumental uh, uh, rather than practical. Uh, but just, just as a kind of a refresher, a fountain is a structure that pours water into a basin or jets water into the sky. Uh, that's important to know, particularly for our fountain, because I want to talk a bit about the style of the fountain. It is, uh, it is a modest example of a Baroque fountain. And Baroque is a style of architecture and design that developed in the 17th and 18th century. It's characterized by lavish decoration, including sculpture. And the sculpture and the moving water combine together to create an animation and even to excite emotions. Um, uh, Baroque is a, is a particularly expressive and exciting uh, kind of architecture. Um, our fountain is circular, it has tiered basins, and those two characteristics were very common in Italian Baroque. Um, the, um, a special feature, which I think you can see on this, uh, on this slide, a special feature are the four 
hippocamps. Now, a hippocamp is a mythological creature that has the head and the forebody of a horse and the tail of a fish or a serpent. So if you look at it quickly from a distance, you see horses. But if you get up close, you see the scaly tail of a fish or a serpent. It's quite a, a fascinating combination, uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not totally unique. Uh, we have found a uh, very similar, perhaps almost exactly the same uh, uh, fountain in uh, San Marino, California at the Huntington Library. Uh, uh, theirs has the same features, uh, the same hippocamps as, as ours. Now, in the fall of 2009, the Alexander Company, which, as you know, was the developer of the seminary, commissioned a reproduction of a horse's head and a top basin that had been lost. They refurbished the fountain, they fixed its plumbing, and, you know, just, in effect, recreated it, brought it back to life for, for the campus. Moving on from, uh, from the fountain, uh, the, the, the first sculpture that SOS took on on our own completely uh, was the statue of Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, our statue of Joan of Arc, is a hollow cast bronze figure. It rests on a self base. Do you know what a self base is? Statues often sit or rest on a base, but usually or often the base is separate from the statue. But a self base is a base that's actually a part of the statue itself. So if you've got a bronze statue and a bronze base and they're, they were sculpted and created at the same time, you know, as part of the same singular item, then that's a self base. So we, self bases pop up again throughout my discussion, so that's why we needed to stop for that. Okay, so um, it sits on a self base, which in turn sits on a stone pedestal, which is part of the staircase at the entrance of Senior House. When the restoration of the seminary buildings began, uh, this sculpture, like many others, was dirty. Its gold paint job had faded. It was flaking. It was deteriorating. And, and, and it was corroded. SOS hired a conservator who washed the statue, removed layers of dirt and grime, cleaned it with specialized tools and scrubbers, uh, waxed it and buffed it, and brought it back to uh, what you will see uh, uh, very shortly. The restoration of Joan of Arc was completed in July 2011. Now our bronze Joan of Arc is a copy, not just a copy, but an, a replica, an exact replica um, of um, a statue um, that was originally called Joan of Arc of Dome Rime. It was sculpted by a French artist, Henri Chaput. Uh, his name and the name of the foundry uh, where the original statue was made are etched into the base of our statue. Uh, so so it's, it's such a replica that it even replicated the, the etchings uh, on it. Um, Chaput was a classical sculptor known for his elegant naturalism. And, and because of that, he represented Joan not on horseback wearing a suit of armor as she is frequently uh, represented, but rather as a young shepherdess in Lorraine listening to the voices telling her to liberate the French from the English. Um, Chapu made the original plaster statue in 1870 and then the marble statue in 1872. The sculpture was displayed at the Louvre and it was a popular success. It's now located in a different museum. Uh, it became the most famous image of Joan of Arc in France, and copies were uh, widely distributed in different materials and different sizes uh, around Europe and through North America, particularly after 1900. In the early 1920s, this is a little bit of a departure from the seminary, but it's, it's interesting, if nothing else. In the early 1920s, four exact plaster replicas of the statue ended up in four women's teachers' college, colleges in Virginia. Now, the names of the colleges have changed over time, but you'll recognize their current names. James Madison University, the University of Mary Washington, Longwood University, and Radford University. 
Now we've read that the four replicas were gifts of the French government in appreciation for America's role in World War I. But we've also read that the Longwood replica was purchased from a company in Boston and the Radford replica was a gift of the class of 1921. So nobody really knows where the, how those schools got those statues. The uh, curator at James Madison speculates that their replica may have been an illegal copy of the original in Paris and that the French government knew of the forgery but were unwilling to destroy it, which is what the French government usually did when they discovered a of an art forgery, uh, but they were unwilling to, to uh, destroy it because Joan was their patron saint and destroying it would be both a sacrilege and very unpatriotic. So maybe the story of the four gift statues was an elaborate ploy to get the forgery out of France and out of sight before anybody noticed it. At any rate, we'll move on to, uh, to Cyparissus which is an especially beloved, beloved statue on the campus. It's located at the top of the glen, across from Senior House, across the parking lot you know, from Senior House. It's a marble sculpture, and it's of a young man kneeling to hold a slain deer. The figures rest on an oval self base that is set on a marble plinth and on top of an oval pedestal made of field stone. Cyparissus was a young man who killed his favorite stag by mistake. The statue shows him in a state of inconsolable grief. To ease his grief, the gods changed him into a cypress tree, which has become a symbol of grief and was often used and planted in cemeteries. This is more of a European thing than an American thing, uh, but uh, 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 in lots of places, the cypress is still a symbol of grief. Cyparissus, played a different kind of role for the seminary students. Before the Capitol Beltway was built in the 1960s, there was a footbridge across the Glen to the railroad station. A student knew if, the, if she heard the train whistle before it reached the, uh, the statue at the entrance to the bridge, she would miss her train. And so the statue became known as the, oh my God, I've missed the train statue. In the fall of 2011, SOS volunteers, with training that SOS arranged uh, uh, by a conservation consulting company, washed the statue and treated it with biocide to kill organic growth and protect it from further, uh, further stress. The Alexander Company trimmed the nearby trees to increase the sunlight and reduce the biological growth on the statue. The trimming also made the statue stand out against the dark forest, the dark woods, uh, more dramatically. Now, Joan and Cyparissus are statues that have been uh, on the campus in public sight for a long time. You may all have had a chance to see them many times, but another statue uh, is just recently returned to the campus. Uh, we think this statue was originally located in the villa gardens across the glen. We used to call the statue the young woman, maybe just for want of a better name. It is a statue of a young woman. Uh, but now we call it Hope. Hope statues are allegorical figures often used in graveyards, cemeteries, and memorials. They're a Victorian art form from the late 19th century. American versions of Hope statues are usually carved in limestone or marble, and our, our copy, our version, is, is marble. A typical Hope statue would be a female figure wearing a Roman stola, which is the female version of the toga, uh, and also wearing a pala, uh, or a, a mantle, the kind of mantle that you can put up over your head. Um, hope is always represented with an anchor, in the Christian tradition, the anchor is a symbol of hope. Based on a New Testament reference, hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Um, now much of the symbolism, including the anchor, especially including the anchor, much of the symbolism of hope statues is modeled after earlier statues of a Saint Philomena, uh, who 
was also kind of a patron saint of hope. In, in our seminary statue, unfortunately, one arm and much of the anchor is broken off. Now, earlier this summer, Hope was taken out of storage where it had been for 25 years. Uh, it was cleaned by SOS volunteers, and it's now in place in the small park facing Cassidy, <coughs> excuse me, facing Cassidy Street across from the side of the gymnasium. So if you haven't seen it, make a point of going, going to see it. Now, we have a reclining lion statue. Don't confuse this with... Uh, our pair of reclining lions, but this reclining lion statue is a, a single statue, small statue, made of concrete, uh, reclining, as I said, and it is, one, it is one of a pair, but, but one of the pair was stolen in the 90s, and so the other was put into storage. We've taken it out of storage, uh, SOS volunteers cleaned it and returned it to a site very close to where it originally stood on the uh, uh, Aloha, Aloha entrance stairway, uh, close to the chapel. Another statue, which we have recently taken out of uh, storage, is the nymph and the fawn. And the nymph and fawn uh, is a marble statue originally located under the covered walkway between the ballroom and the Swiss chalet. It's being cleaned in a temporary location close to here, uh, near the ballroom, near the ballroom drive through on the fountain side. Um, in Greek mythology, nymphs were minor female deities who were believed to animate nature and personify nature's creative force. Uh, their natural habitats were the wooded, the woods, the glens, the mountains, the rivers and springs. And they're usually depicted as young maidens who love to sing and dance. Uh, their free spirit is very much in contrast to the restricted lives of women who actually lived in the Greek city-states. A fawn, on the other hand, or I shouldn't say a fawn, I should say fawn. Let me back up a bit. And the word nymph is a kind of a category. It's a type of deity. So there are lots of nymphs around, or there were presumably lots of nymphs around, but fawn, is the name of one particular god. Uh, so, so it's, um, so Faun is part of Roman mythology and he's a counterpart to the Greek god Pan. Now both, both Pan and Faun were nature gods and both are depicted as half goat from the waist down and half man from the waist up and goat horns on the head. The, uh, the, end, the, the seminary statue shows Fawn with a musical instrument known as a pan flute, but music and flutes were not part of the Fawn myth. They were borrowed from the Greek myth of Pan, who was said to have created the pan flute. So this kind of overlap between Greek and Roman mythology is very confusing, but it was commonplace. The, the Romans did it all the time. So, um, so that's what we've, we've got here. I'm going to move on. Uh, to, to a, another category of statues. These are the ones that we haven't done much work on or haven't done all the work we want to on, but they are a high priority for the you know, foreseeable future. And, and the first uh, statue, actually it should be plural, statues in this category are the reclining lions. This is a pair of hollow zinc lions reclining on self bases that sit on concrete and field stone plinths on either side of stairs leading down from the fountain circle uh, close to uh, where the American bungalow is. Now, by the mid 19th century, zinc statues of animals had become a common feature of American and European landscape design. Animal statues were often displayed in pairs. The seminary once had at least six animal pairs on the campus. And of those six, six pairs, there are only two complete pairs that remain, and this is one of them. Um, the, um, the students nicknamed the zinc reclining lions Theo and Leo, uh, but they actually have a better name. Uh, 
or at least a more scholarly name, uh, they are examples of what is known as the Schiffelman reclining lions. In the 1860s, A. Schiffelman, a Berlin sculptor, created a pair of reclining lions that were widely reproduced in zinc with some variations made by different companies. The Schiffelman lions each have one paw extending over the edge of their self base, like that. Um, and the head and tail are on the same side. In other words, the, the tail is on the same side of the lion as the lion's head is facing. Okay. And so the two lions sit on their, on their uh, uh, pedestals and they look at each other. Okay. Um, and they look very similar, but in fact they are not exact copies of each other, they're not mirror images of each other, there's a little bit of variation uh, in them and that's one of the characteristics of the Schiffelman lion, to not, not have uh, the, the mirror image characteristic. So our lions were made by um, the J.L. Mott Iron Works of New York City. That name is going to pop up a lot as, as I talk here tonight. Um, the lions have been compromised by age and by deferred maintenance. The self bases are seriously damaged by people sitting on the lions. Um, the painted surfaces are flaking and deteriorating. They were put in storage in 2004 and they were returned to their original site in October 2011 with a wooden frame inside to stabilize the base. But restoration by a professional conservator is needed and is planned for, although it's not yet scheduled. So this is a, this is a work to, uh, that we hope to begin when we're in a position to do that. In a similar way, uh, Hiawatha, a, 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 a statue of an Indian, stands near Linden Lane, so close to a window in the Spanish mission that some of the Theta Sigma Rho sorority sisters called him Peeping Tom. But Hiawatha, I think, is his official name, as best we can understand. This is a zinc statue of a young man in buckskin breeches and a cape with a three-feathered headdress and a bow, which the bow is now damaged. Uh, his clothing and his bear claw necklace are very finely detailed. I mean, it's, it, it displays, this statue displays a very high degree of artistry. Uh, although, to be fair, um, there are so many different tribes that are represented by versions of this statue around the country that, that we do have to say that his clothing can't possibly be accurate for every tribe uh, that, uh, uh, that has laid claim to him or has had people lay claim on their behalf. At any rate, the model for the statue was carved in wood by Samuel Robb, and it is said to be in the Smithsonian's Museum of American History. Robb carved it for William DeMuth, the late nation's leading distributor of cigar store Indians. DeMuth's catalog in 1872 identified the statue as number 53 Indian chief and many copies of the statue were made in zinc by the Mott Iron Works. The statue was one of the best known zinc figures in the country. It was very popular and it was widely used in civic monuments throughout the country. For example, Schenectady, New York has one named Lawrence the Indian. Mount Kisco has Chief Kisco. Ishpeming, Michigan has Old Ish. Calhoun, Georgia has Sequoia. Fargo, North Dakota had a statue just like ours, but it was damaged and is now lost. Point Richmond, California st had a statue that was struck by a truck and its pieces were donated to the war effort in 1943. We even know of a statue of Hiawatha in Peru. Um, but our, our statue of Hiawatha has been inspected by a conservationist and we know what level of restoration is needed and we, we plan to, to restore it, but that is not yet uh, uh, scheduled or funded yet. Next in line is, is the Porch of the Maidens. The, the Porch of the Maidens is an installation consisting of ten caryatids 
that connect together, connect Aloha House with the chapel. Uh, it's really a very dramatic installation. Um, the, uh, the, the caryatids themselves are female figures. Um, in, fact, a, in fact, a caryatid is a female figure that functions as a column supporting a beam or an arch. So it's a statue, but it's also a column. Uh, the Porch of the Maidens is, in, is intact, and it's in good condition. The statues, however, have been painted with an inappropriate covering, and some of them are now peeling, stripping uh, the, the paint and covering them with a mineral-based coating is advisable, but it's not yet scheduled. So that brings us to our last category. That's basically the what's left category. What are the things that we know are important and we want to do something about them, but we haven't addressed them yet and we haven't established priorities for them yet? Uh, that would include the colonnade caryatids. This is a second set of caryatids that the seminary once had. Uh, it was a group of 20 or more caryatids formed, which formed the statuary colonnade. And that colonnade, uh, that, that group of statues supported a T-shaped glass-covered walkway that connected the gymnasium and Aloha House and also spanned Linden Lane to connect to Recitation House, a building that has now been torn down. The Army tore down the, road, the walkway in the 1940s, and around that time, most of the caryatids uh, from the colonnade uh, were sold or otherwise lost to the seminary. Only two remain on campus. One has been placed near the corner of Linden and Ament, close to uh, a part of the colonnade's original location. The other is near the beginning. It's also close to a mint. It's near the beginning of the interpretive trail and the old trail in the park behind the Ament Street townhouses. Uh, these statues should be repaired and cleaned, but they are a lower priority than other statues that are still in storage. Now, just for the record, there are four other colonnade caryatids that are in private hands nearby. They're located in the rear yard of a, a home on Jones Mill Road. They are clearly visible from a walking trail in a nearby park. Uh, the, trail, the trail runs parallel to, uh, to Jones Mill. Uh, so so they're, they're very visible to us if you ever want to go and see them and you'll, you'll see they clearly are the same, the same kind of statue as we have on display at the seminary. Now, on the far side of the Glen, we have three larger-than-life statues of classical figures. Uh, they, they are close to the Italian villa dormitory and to where the villa garden was located. The statues are all female, all clothed in Roman dress. They are constructed of cast stone, and they're in fairly stable condition with some cracks and considerable surface dirt. The first is Justice, located to the west of the villa, close to the glen. She's blindfolded and has an 1867 inscription at the base that predates the seminary by about 30 years. So we know Justice was located somewhere else before she came to the, cemetery, to the seminary. Her sword, her scales, and some fingers have been broken off and lost. The second of the, of the, the three is Minerva, located between the villa and the beltway near the railroad tracks. She was a Roman goddess, the daughter of Jupiter. She is depicted with a castle-like crown, a shield, and a caduceus, which is a, a staff with two snakes wrapped around it. Um, those details refer to the various roles that Minerva played. She was goddess of war, she was herald of victory, she was protector of cities, and patron of art and trade, a multitasker. Um, Silver uh, is located in the woods close to Smith Drive. She's a goddess of mechanical arts and is said to be the sister of Minerva. Our statue shows her with a hammer and a gear wheel. Now the name Sil Silva may be a variation of Silvia and Silvius, which were names derived from the Latin word for woods.
Now at one time, the seminary owned four um, sculptures that are known as Herms or Hermas, and I'm gonna call them Herms just because it's easier. So we had four Herms, but now only two remain, and we do not know where the other two are. Uh, but what we have, and what we assume is true of, of the ones that are missing, um, are made of marble, um, and two of them originally stood on the columned porch attached to practice house. Now, a herm is a sculpture with a head and usually a torso above a plain square column or base. You can see that, yes, good photograph there. Uh, herm is named after Hermes, the god of the god of transitions and boundaries, and the patron of travelers, herdsmen, and thieves. Uh, the original herms were boundary stones or road markers. Uh, there were Roman and Renaissance versions as well, and they, they were called termini, uh, just a different name for the same thing. We have a pair of standing lions. This is the second pair that we still have out of the six. Um, this is our only, rem this is one of the two of our remaining animal pairs. These are much smaller than the zinc uh, lions that we've talked about already. And they're standing, as I said, rather than reclining, and they're made of concrete rather than zinc. Uh, we're not sure of their original location, but it's likely that they, uh, that they were located near the seminary playing fields which would be across Linden Lane from the stable and the gymnasium, where new, new townhouses exist now. Uh, they, the standing lions are, are damaged, especially the tail, the thinnest parts, the tail and the legs, uh, with cement, a lot of the cement uh, has, been, has been lost in those areas. Uh, we have a pair of griffins that stood originally at the entrance to the main building across from the fountain. The Griffin statues are cast zinc, and no surprise here, they were manufactured by the J.L. Mott Iron Works. Uh, now, a griffin was a legendary creature with the head, talons, and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion. They were thought to be especially powerful and majestic creatures. Uh, they were well known for guarding treasure and other valuable possessions. So putting them in the front of your most important building, or at least your earliest building, made good sense. Um, they present a fairly aggressive appearance with their armor and their very visible beak and talons and their large wings. Uh, unfortunately, they are still in storage and they are very badly damaged. In fact, Damaged is an understatement. They are broken into pieces. Um, and then we have an eagle. An eagle with a five-foot wingspan once stood on top of a very tall fieldstone column at Linden Lane near the stable. It is cast zinc, manufactured by Mott, the Mott Iron Works. Uh, it appears to be an example of Buberl's eagle. The original was designed by a Bohemian sculptor, Caspar Buberl. He lived in the 19th century, late latter half of the 19th century. Um, there is a, a mirror image pair of Buberl's eagles, not at the seminary, unfortunately, but at the entrance to the grounds of the armed services uh, home in Washington, D.C. That's on North Capitol Street, you know, near the Washington Hospital Center and Catholic University. So you can, you can go and, and see it sometime to see what, what a, a Buberl eagle looks like. Uh, but our, our eagle is in storage and again, very badly damaged uh, and, and frankly in, uh, in pieces. So with, with the griffins and the eagle, I'm ending the, the, the the, the listing of statues on a, on a sad note. So that seems like a good time to turn it over to Bonnie. <laughs> no, so I'll try to tell you some good news. 
even though we're ending on a, a sad story here. Um, but as you can clearly see in these last photos of the, the headless griffins and the, the eagle in pieces, that a significant amount of work and funds are needed to bring back uh, these statues to their rightful condition. It is the responsibility of the Alexander Company as the developer of National Park Seminary to comply with their county approved site plan uh, to return these uh, statues that have been in storage uh, to their original or their near original location on the property. So of course many of the statues that we showed you to this evening are already in there. Uh, they never got moved or taken and put in storage, so they are in their original location, but those that are in storage are the ones that um, need to come back uh, to their um, original or location that is close as possible considering the changes that may have been made to the, the grounds in the buildings uh, today. Um, but other than the fountain, it is not part of the developer's plan to restore the sculpture. So in 20, 20, 20, 2010, Save Our Seminary embarked on a mission to restore, renew, and remember these outdoor sculptures that once graced the National Park Seminary. Our goal is to ensure that current and future generations of residents and visitors will be able to enjoy and appreciate the historic artistic and cultural value of these sculptures, just as the, the girls of the school and even the, I'm sure, the recovering soldiers um, from, from Walter Reed enjoyed these sculptures. They surely enhance the enchantment of this very special place. Well, we sincerely hope that you can help us in this important effort by contributing to our Outdoor Sculpture Project Fund. Uh, we have a, 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 a special brochure on the table back there where you came in that you can fill out uh, and make a contribution or we also, you can go to our website. Um, but the one exciting thing that um, I'd like to announce this evening is that to recognize um, and honor those donors who have already given uh, $500 or more we have a special plaque that will hang in the lobby of the main building just outside of our office museum. And Fred is going to show, hang, hold, hold up this plaque. So you can see that, a very beautiful plaque. Um, and um, as you might be able to see, we already have a dozen donors at uh, this generous level. We have them in three categories of 500 or more, 1,000 or more, or 2,500 or more, $2,500 or more. And there are several of those donors here this evening with us, and I would like to recognize them if they could please stand. Um, that is Don and Ann Hall over there by the steps. Linda and Jonathan Lyons in the back there, the back row. And Fred and Peg, Peggy Gerasi. Fred. <laughs> and Ginger Nestle. Ginger, where are you? Where's Ginger? There she is, way in the back. All right. Thank you all very much. Of course, we appreciate all donors, no matter what level, um, who support our project to, uh, to do another SOS. It's called Save Outdoor Sculpture at the Seminary, SOS. Um, so at this time, we'd be glad to take any questions you might have about the, the sculptures. Yes? That they, no, it, what is part of their plan, the developer's plan, is that they need to place the statues, return them to their place, but they are not required to uh, restore them. Other than the fountain, the developer did do that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
So the question was, was there any particular theme to the sculptures and that they chose to, to populate around the, the campus? Um, no, but I think maybe Fred can answer that question better based on the, period, the time period. I, I think to, to some extent, the statues were acquired as they became available to, you know, uh, in, uh, to, the, uh, to the owners of the school. But clearly there was an emphasis on classical themes. Uh, education at that time uh, often emphasized the, the classical virtues and class, classical mythology, so that's not surprising at all. If you look at the classical uh, statues that, uh, uh, that, that we showed in the slides, the majority of them, I think, were female statues, so there may have been uh, a conscious effort to have statues that the, the women at the seminary could uh, identify with. Uh, uh, but in addition to that, uh, there was a, a concern for landscape, and there was a consciousness of what good landscape design was at that period of time. Uh, and you know, as, as I said in my commentary, um, landscape design often featured animal, uh, animal statues, uh, and including animal pairs. So you see plenty of evidence of that. So I'd say you know, the animal aspect of, of landscape design, the classicism, and the emphasis on women role models, probably with three significant themes. There may have been more, but that would be my surmise. like a yard sale, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Or a garage sale. Was there another question over here? Or? Oh, there. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, well, we, at first we thought the yellow coating on the zinc sculpture was the Army's version of gold. Um, but we found when the uh, conservation um, restorer worked on the Joan of Arc statue that the yellow was actually a, a primer type of coating because you could still see some of the bronze color paint on top of the yellow. But actually, she found several layers of color on that statue in addition to some lipstick and eyeshadow, I believe, that had been added on, in more recent years. So, yes, here. Okay. Okay, the question was, um, what is the schedule for the nymph and the fawn is in a temporary location outside right now, as Fred explained, um, because we're still doing some uh, additional cleaning. It had a, a material on it that needed some extra work than just general washing. <laughs> Um, so the question was, when will that statue be moved into place? Um, as soon as we can get it cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> and that is going to be very soon because uh, we know what works and it's just a matter. It's just very finely ingrained um, and it just takes longer. You know, the, the surface uh, cleaner has to stay on it for an hour at a time in small sp patches. Um, so I would say probably within the next couple of weeks, yeah. it should um, before Halloween. Before Halloween, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, yes. Were there other yes? Right. What is SOS? What's your thought about the future of the longevity of these 
Well, that's that's a very good question, um, Fred. We, we do know from working with, with the conservator who, who uh, restored uh, Joan of Arc that, that having once been restored, it is important to clean it regularly. Uh, I mean, it's a marble piece and it's intended to be outside and it's intended to stand up to the elements very well. I won't say that it will last forever, but it's going to last a long, long time, particularly if it's cleaned. The marble statues, uh, they do over time uh, lose some of the sheen uh, that, that they might have kept if they were indoor statues. But again, uh, if, if they are cleaned, if the biological uh, growth is, is checked and, and monitored, uh, uh, they will remain uh, true for a long time. And, and I think the same thing is true of the zinc. If we stabilize the zinc statues and, and, and restore them and, 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 and if we clean them appropriately. So right now we're at the stage of, of conserving and cleaning statues, but we know that our volunteers have a long uh, 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 agenda uh, for maintaining the statues on a regular basis over the long period of time. So we have to be committed to maintenance as well as, as, to, uh, as to the initial restoration. I don't think anybody wants to see the statues that were intended to be outside brought inside unless they were really pressing reasons for doing that. Right, and, and most of these statues have been around since the 20s, so um, they have been, in fact, some of them got worse in storage than they probably would outside, but, um, but uh, that, is, that is something you have to balance. But I think if they're, they're brought back correctly and with the right finishes, and, and on a regular maintenance, um, whether it's a painting or, or a cleaning, um, that's pretty much all it needs. Yes, ma'am. Um, the interior, of the statues you, you see here in the ballroom, your question was, Yes, yes, they have remained here um, they, in the ballroom. Yeah, the ballroom was the last building built by the seminary and finished in 1927. So the statues were placed then at that time. Uh, from photographs, I have seen that some of the statues have moved around between the niches, um, or the niches. Uh, but basically, they're, they're all there. Now, some are missing, as you can see. Uh, those were either stolen or broken over time. Um, they are all plaster cast statues. They're not marble or anything. They're just plaster. So, and several, I, let's say, I think it was four or five of those were repaired. Um, by the Alexander Company, the developer, when the, the ballroom was restored two years ago, three years ago now. Yes, was there another question in the front here? Oh, okay. The old photo of Leo and Leo to the left is the bench. Yes, a beautiful bench, yeah. You know, uh, right, and sculpture really has a broader sense in the term. We were really talking tonight about statues. But sculpture in the broader sense means any carved three-dimensional product or, or image, not image, but a three-dimensional object. Um, and those, that carved bench that was next to the Leo and Theo lions, um, unfortunately was stolen. Uh, probably, I think it was early 1990s that disappeared one day. Um, yes. Yes, the question, have we considered talking to the, yes, and Fred actually talked to them, so he can, I'll let him answer that. Well, we, we, we have talked to the, to the, to the current owners. Uh, their, their, um, their family memory is that, that the, a homeowner that preceded them in that, that location had bought the statue, uh, uh, the four statues, the four caryatids from the army. And now this would have been at a time when a, the Army owned them, they were the legal owner, and B, there was no historic preservation protection on the site. It had not been 
placed on the register. So, so the Army was certainly within their rights to sell them or to give them away. Uh, but but uh, the family feels fairly certain, uh, although they could not prove it, you know, with paperwork or anything, that, uh, that, they, had, uh, that they had originally been bought and paid for uh, uh, in a transaction with the Army. Um, the, the original buyer sold the house, the next owner, you know, kept them, and, and then the next generation kept, kept them and built a grape arbor and, and so on. And then finally, the, the son of, of the most recent owner uh, built his own house on a, on a lot behind his parents' house and moved the statues there and moved them closer to the trail so they're more visible, did some landscaping so they were more visible, put up some protective devices, fencing and, and uh, security systems, and repaired them. So clearly the owners are taking care of them, but just as clearly they have no desire to give them up. Uh, they, uh, they, they asked us not to go overboard with advertising their, their location, uh, but that everybody was welcome to walk down that trail and see them and take pictures and enjoy them. Uh, as, as they could. And I think that's, that is about as generous as they're prepared to be. And uh, we've talked to lawyers, lawyers who were on our board, uh, and they've told us that there is no basis for making a claim. Uh, and and uh, so I think, I, think it, I think we probably have the best deal we're going to get. Right? I thought, you know, the neighborhood, like, behind the library and the left there, used to live back there. Say that again about the statuary in the neighborhood? It, it's, yeah, Woodstock Avenue. Yeah. Because, you know, I've just seen the statuary. I, 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 I've lived on Woodstock Avenue for, uh, for about 25 years, yeah. and I have seen things like, you know, concrete urns. In fact, I own a couple, and I'd be willing to give them away. Uh, uh, but but I, I heard uh, of, uh, of somebody who had found a head of a statue uh, in their property. And I, I tried to uh, track down who it was, but never was able to do that. So I think you're right. I mean, certainly we dig up all kinds of small things, like broken dishes and things like that, throughout the neighborhood. But occasionally, a, a, a piece of statuary will, will show up. Uh, but so far, nothing. So, so far, nothing, uh, nothing significant has come to my attention. Uh, right. Yeah, and as Fred mentioned too, and, and you, you mentioned about the bench, you know, there are urns, there were many um, urns. There is one urn left over by the Statue of um, Justice, if you ever go over to the gardens over by the villa. But you'll see broken pieces laying around too, and you know, in the long run, all those pieces and all the statues do belong to the property here. They are just a, like a piece of the building. Um, they are part of the real property here, so they belong to the seminary. Yes, Ian. Okay. Oh, they, yes, there is another basin type of font that's right here at the base of the uh, uh, ballroom building along the driveway across from the pagoda. Um, and that has been here in pictures anyway since the, the ballroom was built. Um, and it does, it looks like almost like a baptismal font. Um, the thing is we don't know the provenance of any, almost any of these statues. We don't know where the school got them other than the zinc sculptures as, as Don mentioned that were probably bought at a you know, end of year sale. Um, uh, but uh, there are no records, and we just know the, when they appeared on the campus by following the, the school photographs in, in catalogs and so on, we can date. And it looks like the early, early to mid-20s were the period that, and those were the golden years of the school, so they probably had more money then, so they were able to purchase these pieces and bring them um, to the campus. So, any more questions? No. Well, thank you all very much, and I hope you learned something tonight about statues.